Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's meeting of the Commonwealth Club California, the place where you are in the know. I am Fred Blackwell, the CEO of the San Francisco Foundation and your chair for the program. Uh, this program is supported by our Bay Area Leads uh, Fund and is part of the foundation series on people, place, and power, addressing uh, access and equity in the Bay Area. Uh, today's program is entitled The Art of Resistance in the Bay Area. Uh, from the beat of the drum, to the stroke of the brush, to the power of the spoken word, art has been central to Bay Area's long history of activism. Uh, it's those movements that have partnered closely with artists that have had some of the most profound uh, ripple effects, uh, from the immigrant rights work uh, to LGBTQ pride movement. Uh, in its many forms, art has the power to touch hearts, change minds, and strengthen communities during difficult times. Uh, today, as we face a new set of challenges, protest art is experiencing a renaissance uh, in the Bay Area. With the click of a mouse, movement artists are able, are engaging new audiences on a whole new set of platforms. You're about to meet some of the Bay Area's most renowned art activists uh, to discuss the role of art in today's social justice movements. Uh, but before I introduce all of the panelists, uh, I want to um, first introduce writer, poet, and actor Hiroshi Kashiwagi. Uh, Mr. Kashiwagi is a 95-year-old Nisei uh, and is a native of Sac Sacramento, California. In his latest book, Starting from Loomis to other and Other Stories, he writes of his boyhood in a small rural town in Northern California. Uh, a victim of government incarceration during World War II, he was relocated to Tule Lake, is it Tule? Tule Lake Segregation Center as a no-no and later is a, a renunciant. He credits San Francisco civil rights attorney Wayne Collins uh, for the restoration of his citizenship in 1959. And ironically, he began his writing and acting career at Tule Lake. Uh, he is a lifetime member of the Screen Actors Guild, uh, the Dr Dramatists Guild, uh, the American Federation of Television and Radio Artists, and today he is going to start off our program with one of his poems. Please welcome Hiroshi Kajawagi. In early 1943, the War Relocation Authority, in order to determine who was eligible for release from prison, ordered everyone 17 years and over to answer a series of questions, including the two key questions, number one, are you willing to serve in the armed services of the United States? Two, will you forswear allegiance to the Japanese emperor? Any negative or qualified answers to the questions placed one in the, quote, disloyal category and was either held back or sent to Tule Lake, which became a maximum security prison for, quote, disloyal Americans. I will read the poem titled, Fences. We, we've lived with a fence all our lives. First at Arboga Prison, then at Tule Lake Concentration Camp. I mean a barbed wire fence eight foot high with guard towers and searchlights after dark. Don't try them. Don't even go near the fence or the guns would explode in your face. 
after our release, there was a fence. But you were free. I mean, a symbolic one to ward off the disdain and contempt of people in our own community. So we built an imaginary fence. Never mention Tule Lake, that we were segregated as disloyals and troublemakers and held back at Tule Lake. Because we protested the injustice of incarceration, because we said no, no to the loyalty questions, because we asserted our rights as American citizens. Now, yet another fence at Turi Lake is proposed, this time a real one, to cut off access to the campsite, the source of our painful memory, a sacred place we return to for remembrance, for solace, for healing. Furthermore, it is a national historic site and a lasting reminder of our government's failure, where the government admitted its failure, a reminder never to happen again. Tule Lake must remain a national historic site, as it is without a fence, accessible to all Americans, no fence around it, not another fence. Thank you, Hiroshi, that was fabulous. Um, now it's my pleasure to introduce the other panelists. Um, first, I'll start with uh, Kat Brooks. Kat has been confidently moving across stages and screens for 30 years. A consummate performer and a passionate speaker, Kat is also an activist and community leader. She played a central role in the struggle for justice for Oscar Grant and is the co-founder of the Anti-Police Terror Project, whose mission is to rapidly respond to and eradicate police terror in communities of color. APTP has successfully developed a model for first response to police violence that is currently being replicated across the state of California and the country. Kat is also the executive director of the Justice Teams Network, a statewide network that merges rapid response models to all forms of state violence. Kat trained at the Royal National Theatre Studio in London and was recently nominated Best Featured Actress by the Bay Area Theatre Circle's critics. She is a member of the Black Power Network, Black Lives Matter Bay Area, and the Black Friday 14, a group of black activists who locked down the West Oakland BART station on Black Friday of 2014. She is also co-host of the morning radio show up front on Pacifica's KPFA radio network. Please join me in welcoming her. <laughs> Next to Kat is Jose Navarrete, who is a native of Mexico City, where he was first exposed to, it, to theater and dance, choreography and performing arts in parks, hospitals, uh, children's parties, and his clown as a dancer. He studied dance at the National Institute of Fine Arts in Mexico and has a BA in anthropology from UC Berkeley and an MFA in dance from Mills College. Jose is the recipient of a Chime Across Borders Fellowship with Ralph Lemon and has taught dance and performance to kids, youth, adults in Mexico and throughout the Bay Area. 
Jose founded his own interdisciplinary performance company with Debbie Kajiyama, Yama? Kajiyama, uh, NAKA Dance Theater in 2001. He was recently named U.S. Japan Creative Arts Fellow and will be traveling to Japan in 2018. Welcome. <laughs> Faviana Rodriguez is a transdisciplinary artist, cultural strategist, and activist based in Oakland, California. Her work and collaborative initiatives address migration, economic inequality, gender justice, and ecology. Faviana's artistic practices include printmaking, installation, social practice, digital organizing, and institution building, and I'm sure a number of others that aren't even on this list. Uh, Faviana is the executive director of Culture Strike, a national arts organization that engages artists, writers, and performers in immigrant rights. In 2012, she was featured in a documentary series by Pharrell Williams uh, titled Migration is Beautiful, which addressed how artists responded to failed immigration uh, policy in the United States. In wait, wait, wait. <laughs> in 2016, she received Robert Rauschenberg's Artist and Activist Fellowship for her work around mass incarceration. And in 2017, she was awarded the Atlantic Fellowship for Racial Equity for work around racial justice and climate change. And now you can give her a round of applause. And finally, our moderator today, Mina Kim, is KQED uh, News evening anchor and Friday host of Forum. Mina started her career in public radio as an intern at KQED, uh, becoming a general assignment reporter, then health reporter for the California Report. Her work has been recognized by the Radio, Television, Digital News Association, the Society of Professional Journalists, and the Asian American Journalists Association, and I'm going to now turn it over to her as you give her a round of applause. <laughs> Thanks, Fred. Well, good evening, everybody. It is a pleasure to be moderating this conversation with, as Fred described, renowned local artists and about art and activism in this particular cultural and political moment. And in conversations with these panelists before tonight, I could really feel their passion and commitment to their craft, but also a very keen sense of the power of what they do right now. And you got to witness some of that as you listened to Hiroshi Kashiwagi's poem. Um, and Hiroshi, I, I just, I'm struck by the fact that in the most restrictive of environments. It was there where you found poetry and acting, right, as a, as a calling for you, as something that you started to build your life and focus around. Is that, is that correct, that it was there, ironically, that you discovered, uh, discovered poetry and acting? Uh, well, not when I was there. I mean, in fact, I was living it so that it was later that I started to write. Okay, I think in your bio earlier, as it was being read, it talked about that as being the environment, but you did practice it there, right? Like you tried writing. Well, what I did uh, at, at Tully Lake was that I joined a writer's group. Mm -hmm. And so I was writing and uh, then I joined a th little theater group where I was performing. So those are the two positive things that I, I did. Associate with it, yes, I'm sure, mm -hmm. in a very incredibly difficult circumstance. How did writing, acting help you process your experience at Tule Lake? Well, those were things that I always liked to do. Uh, I started in early on in, in uh, elementary school and high school. So that uh, while I was doing that, uh, well, you know, I, I lose sight of the surrounding and the camp and the imprisonment so that I would uh, devote myself to the to the active creative activities yes so i i remember that fondly yes 
Do you worry ever that, um, that, that there are parallels now, that we are in a moment where you could see a return to this idea of really vilifying a particular race or ethnicity that could lead to the kind of imprisonment just based on association? Yes, I, I'm very sensitive to that. Uh, of course, I, it's, you don't know what's going to happen. Uh, things are so unsettled. Mm. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I feel very emboldened by my experience. Uh, it wasn't until lately that I realized that I didn't do anything wrong in protesting. Hmm. It's a tradition in our American dr uh, democracy. And so people are recognizing what we did. But for years, we were the uh, object of uh, ostracism by our own community. They said that we you know, dishonored them, especially the super patriotic people. Uh, and so, uh, yeah. Because you said no to the questionnaire, no to military service, and no that you wouldn't. Right. Allegiance I to, said yes, no to both not. those mm -hmm. questions, yes. Well, Fabiana, you've said that what has marked this social and cultural moment for you to some degree is the normalization of hate. Could you explain what you mean by that? Mm -hmm. um, but also, you've talked about how in this moment, at the same time, you have lots of reasons for hope. So kind of describe hate and how your hope fits into mm -hmm. that. Yeah, so I think that um, art is a part of culture, and culture surrounds us all the time. And culture is shaped by the stories that we tell. Um, and you don't always have to be an artist to tell those stories. And politicians have told many stories that have created bad policy. And these stories, they're not rooted in reality. They're fictional, and they're rooted actually in racism or um, and xenophobia. Um, for example, the story about a wall. That's a very powerful metaphor that keeps people out. Or the story of anti-blackness, which has been part of um, many myths that keeps getting perpetuated. And so when I talk about the normalization of hate, what's happened is that the way that um, stories have been normalized to exclude people. So for example, when we go to the movies and we see mostly white actors, that's very normal to us. But in reality, it's, there's nothing normal about that. There's, and, and when you see a lot of violence against women or when you actually the fact that Black Panther, for example, was so surprising to us means that it's so unnormalized, right? Like it's so it's not normal. Yeah, it's, it's not normal to see that. And yet we always see um, white people in those spaces and having those narratives. In other words, what the image that we see of humanity is, is very white. Um, and so what's been normalized is these narratives around who belongs here and who doesn't. And it, it's, it's really, they're very exclusionary. Um, and, and I believe that the role of artists is for us to counter those narratives, but also create the stories in which we all belong and the stories to make normal um, things like inclusion or, or, you know, having multiracial communities or, you know, falling in love with people of all genders. Those things are normal in our communities, but they're not normal in the culture that we see projected back to us. So I, I think that um, we need to be creating, as artists, not only speaking out about the things we don't like and not just about the things we're against, but also the things that we're for and the world that we really want to see. Th those need to be made into films and plays and visual art and music and poetry because once we have those things, and you know, as we witnessed with you know, big works of art like Black Panther, then you build on that. You keep making it better and better. Well, Kat, talk a little bit about how you've used your talents to bring attention to officer-involved killings. Um, sure. So in, in the bio that, that Fred read, um, talked about Oscar Grant, which is sort of... I mean, I've been an activist my whole life. I was an artist before I was an activist. I started uh, training in theater at the age of eight. Um, and that's where I got my degree in, et cetera. But uh, when Oscar was murdered... 
I call it my, my it's like my enough button was mm. was pushed. Like I just, it was just no more, right? I just, I couldn't, I couldn't breathe for like a week, um, and then sort of went. <sighs> feet first into the, the movement. Now mind you, I just moved from LA where I was, was acting most of the time. Um, but anyway, so I ended up writing this, this poem called How to Explain to My Three-Year-Old. My daughter was three. Um, and uh, about why she hadn't seen me all week, right? Why we were marching in the streets. Um, there was this, this, this um, story that I heard that Tatiana Oscar Grant's daughter had asked um, if there were cell phones in heaven because she wanted to call her father. And there was, there was just so much pain um, expressed by the family, but also in the streets of Oakland um, that I encapsulated that in, inside of poetry. So that's, and it sort of became the mantra of the movement um, for a while. Um, most recently, I've written a one-woman show at six characters, 35 minutes, um, of raw theater, we call it, called Tasha. And it's the story of Natasha McKenna, uh, a, a name that I'm, I'm guessing most of you. Actually, can I see a show? How many of you have ever heard of Natasha McKenna? One. You don't count, Debbie. <laughs> Two. <laughs> Debbie produced the piece along with what I was saying. <laughs> but uh, T Natasha McKenna uh, was living with schizophrenia. She called the police because something had happened at her house. The police showed up. They took her to jail, uh, sent her into full schizophrenic um, episode. Uh, they wanted to move her uh, to another facility. She's in f full schizophrenic episode. And their decision was to send seven cops in hazmat suits into her cell uh, where she was naked. And they eventually ended up tasing her to death. And um, this was right on the heels of another woman, Yvette Henderson, that was murdered with an AR-15 in broad daylight by the Emeryville Police Department on the Emeryville-West Oakland border. And, the, and that all coincided with the, with the Say Her Name movement that sprung up, right, that historically we've been talking about black men. Um, but that's one of the beautiful things that the Black Lives Matter movement brought to us is, is Say Her Name. And so I was just sitting as an artist with, with all of these women's stories in my head and in my heart. And, um, I thought I was going to do vignettes of all of the women that had been murdered uh, over the last, it had been 12 months, I guess. And Tasha just started talking to me really loudly, just really loudly. It was like 3 o'clock in the morning, and I got up, and I just started writing. Um, and so at first, it started off as a monologue uh, that Debbie and Jose helped me uh, put together. And now it's a, a one-woman show um, mm. that I do around the Bay and around the country when people will let me come tell her story. And how would you... Where would you say we are right now? I mean, we just had this killing of Stefan Clark, right? And Hiroshi described this moment as unsettled. Um, Faviana's talking about the normalization of just whiteness as the norm everywhere, and, and those messages, when they're disrupted, really kind of startle us, right? Because it's been so present. Where would you say we are now in terms of you know, the issue of officer-involved shootings and how we're responding to them. Um, so I'm going to call it police terror because I'm an artist and I'm a radical activist and I'm speaking euphemisms and I believe when we speak in euphemisms, we water down the people's will to resist, right? So it's, it's not violence, it's terrorism. And your group is called Anti-Police anti -police terror, terror Project. Project. And the dash is between police and terror. It's not the Anti-Police Terror Project, right? right. It's Anti-Police Terror, which hopefully all of us in this room are Anti-Police Terror. Mm -hmm. um, nobody wants unarmed black and brown um, men and women and boys and girls being gunned down in the street. I'm assuming, right, that those are the folks that are in this room. Mm -hmm. um, so we shouldn't be afraid to call it what it is. Um, I, you know, it's, it's, it's really sort of twofold for me. Like, on the one hand, um, we were, we've got an administration that rolled back the very moderate reforms that the Obama administration put forth, right? So um, the lifting of the consent decrees, right? But we have to remember that of all of the thousands of police departments that are in the United States of America, only 17 of them had consent decrees. And if you want to talk about their effectiveness, let's talk about the fact that the Oakland Police Department has been under consent decree for 15 years. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be a two-year process. Um, that said, at the same time, the com I've been doing this work for well over a decade. Yes. The conversation is a very different place, right? So when we were talking about Oscar Grant, like you couldn't even get people to admit that there was a problem. Nobody, right? Mm -hmm. Even black people didn't really want to talk about it out loud. We knew it was an issue, mm -hmm. right? But like, like to be saying it so loudly and demanding that an end come and finding allies in all of these amazing places, the, the needle has moved. It's moving yeah. slowly painfully slowly, 
particularly for families like uh, of Stefan Clark, or, or I gotta say his name, Shalene Tyndall, who was shot three times in the back by a BART police officer on January 3rd in, at the West Oakland Station, right? Um, painfully, slowly, but I, I do believe it's moving, and I actually talk about the Trump administration as an opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. I'm an organizer, right? You have laid your cards on the table, we know where you're coming from. We know how you're coming for us, right? You have made plain, I, I'll call it, 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 he's unmasked America, mm -hmm. right? I don't have to convince. Mm -hmm. There are people I used to have to convince mm -hmm. that America had a race problem. <laughs> I don't have to have a lot of those conversations anymore, <laughs> right? There's either white folks that are supporters of Trump going, yep, we sure do, and you're the problem, and we know where we stand, right? Mm -hmm. Or white folks are going, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is what, <clears throat> when I was saying, Fabiana, that you had mentioned a moment of hope, what Kat is yeah. saying is very similar to yeah. what you were saying. Yeah, actually, I, I think that because we're very clear that there's, there's gonna be no political wins that culturally were advancing very fast. I mean, if you look at how the youth um, around guns are changing the conversation, mm -hmm. the, sec the, the conversation around sexual harassment, just like that. And what I find really compelling is I, if you really begin to follow how they're E erupting, it's because of stories. Yep. It's stories like Trayvon Martin's story created, helped create Black Lives Matter. Yeah. And it took a woman, Rachel DeHollander, in Michigan to share her story in a newspaper f in order for Nasser to go down. Sh she opened the doors to over 250 stories, just like it took for actresses to be inspired by Toronto, Toronto Burke's work around Me Too to begin to take down the very, very powerful men in Hollywood. And I think that the, the thing that artists do so well and cultural workers is that we know how to tell stories and we know the power of a story and we can make a story pop and we give a story of form so that more people can hear it and it can just you know be amplified so I'm really excited because I feel like also as artists it's just I see so many artists getting activated and artists of all levels I mean you're seeing you know artists I, I would have never thought this could happen but that people for the first time are even saying, um, who are all these white men in Hollywood and why do they have so much power? Oh, let's look over to the art world. Oh, these white men have like, I'm, I'm talking to you, how much power they've consolidated. It's in the like 96 to 98%. I mean, of like critics, heads of boards, curators, heads of major museums, boards of films, directors, composers, like they just dominate. It's entrenched in our entire cultural ecosystem in theater, in music, in the written word, in publishing. Um, I mean, publishing's really bad. So I, I think there's an opportunity for us to say, uh, for us to say like, you know what? You can't control so much of the way that culture is made. It's, it's, a, it's immoral, actually. When you really look at how, like, wh how this country is changing, it's immoral that white men can control 96% of what kinds of films are made. And, and if you think about it even, like, why should we live in a culture where we don't see ourselves reflected? And that's why we have a, I, I really believe when you tie culture precedes political change and that if we're not telling the stories and we're actually contributing to things like unconscious bias and um, you know sexism and gender violence, all that stuff gets shared, it gets um, amplified back to us and it forms the way people vote. So if we wonder why we live in such an anti-immigrant culture, you can actually see, well, because we don't have pro-migrant culture. There's no TV shows about Undocumented people, you know, we we barely. I'm really excited. There's a Black Renaissance actually in the arts because definitely, you know, the the the, what, the doors that Black artists are opening are significant, and and you're like, man, it took this long. <laughs> well, even as we're celebrating how people are getting activated, and at the same time, Jose Navarrete, I want to ask you about the group of women that you specifically work with, because. This is a group that actually, if anything, has felt even more silenced. Mm -hmm. um, and this is primarily Latina women, undocumented women, or they're connected with family members who have been taken away, essentially. Yeah, yeah definitely. So yeah. talk a little bit about the work that you do and how you're trying to bring those voices out. Okay. Yeah, first of all, just I want to say that Fred, or, or something happened in my bio, because oh. actually, um, <laughs> I work at Eastside Arts Alliance. 
I am a curator of, of, the, of the new initiative called Live Arts in Resistance. And you have seen some stills in the screens. And um, just I want to say that, uh, uh, just I want to mention that because oh, Eastside Arts Alliance is a platform for these art expressions oh, uh, create, I created. And um, uh, we have presented Cap Brooks. Uh, Fabiana Rodriguez was one of the members of Eastside Arts Alliance. So it's like I feel that we, yeah. we hold that space for us to represent uh, our culture and our struggle. Um, in terms of the work that I am doing with Mujeres Unidas y Activas, MUA, um, I am working with them. It's a project called Buscarte, that it uh, investigates the concept of disappear, disappearance. And um, we are um, working with them very close. We are um, um, gathering their, their stories and testimonies, and we are creating a multidisciplinary performance with their stories. Um, um, this uh, Mujeres Unidas is a powerful, powerful uh, organization that um, promotes transformation, especially for Latina women that are um, that have so many issues in terms of sexual abuse, domestic violence, and right now, you know, immigration and rates. So. Um, we are uh, providing some workshops that look at art and healing, um, you know, um, elements for them to cope with what is really happening in their community, especially because there is a, a high rate of anxiety and fear yes. that is really happening in, in those communities. And one of the things I think, physical movement is part of that, right, in terms of physical activity to release some of that anxiety and express some of that anxiety in your work? Yeah. Um, actually, my background is in, in, in dance, in movement, and, um, and then I came later, um, you know, looking at performing arts and performance arts, like it looks more, it uses more elements of other fields of art. Uh, but my, my, my core is movement. And when I go to work with Mujeres Unidas, we, I make them, you know, breathe, stretch. And mm. it's one, one interesting thing that happens is that I am trying to use some elements of their culture or their, you know, the popular culture to bring it in. So I start bringing some kind of merengue, right? And then it's like, okay, we are going to move <laughs> kind of the upper <laughs> torso and just breathing. It's like try to figure it out. And I kind of like, you know, like dismantle kind of the concept of movement with them, with the rhythms. And, and I feel that it, is, it's, um, it has a lot of impact yes. in their bodies and also in their way of how they are dealing with their mm -hmm. emotions uh, that they are carrying on. Yeah. yeah. It's, we're getting at, the impact of the art, right? And, and the power that art has. Fafiana, well, I, I want to add something just really important, which I think is the power of art. Because often, you know, I, I, I've, I've been in many social justice spaces. I think there's an emphasis on intellect, on the brain. Like, we're going to read these policy papers and we're going to, you know, try to have all these intellectual debates. And as human beings, we've been sitting around fires and with drums for our entire, like that's what we do as humans. And I think that the arts helps us through all our senses really understand the world. And I think especially if you consider that trauma has been passed down into our DNA, that the arts and especially things that engage us with movements, whether we're drawing or making murals or speaking or dancing, it's about embodied power. And this is what I think is a core thing about the arts is that, and this is why I think the arts is a right of all children, is because we shouldn't just express ourselves by regurgitating what the master narrative is, right? Which is I learn in school from a teacher and I learn how to move in the world. It's more that art teaches you to have your voice and express yourself and be embodied. And this is why I love that we make things as artists. It's an extension of our presence in the world. And that's why it's so important for people from marginalized communities to make art because it's how we interpret the world. Like, I want to see the world through your lens or through the lens of 
immigrant women who are experiencing trauma. And, and that's actually, I think, one of the main demands that we need to have for the arts is that the arts is not only awesome and amazing and we make great, beautiful things, but it is a, a core practice of expression and I would say embodied uh, power. I'm so, I'm so glad. Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm so glad you said that. I, I, I work with um, sexually trafficked young girls and women or girls and young women who are at high risk for being sexually trafficked and we do journaling and we do improv games and they build their own pieces and um, and, and they're all they're all black. They're all black girls. They're all forgotten girls, right? They're who 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 wanna be heard, who's yeah. and have been told to shut up their entire mm -hmm. lives in some of those vulgar vile ways we can imagine. And to see them when they come into the room, right, to when we finalize the program. And it's, it's not me, right? It, it's just that the art becomes, the making of the art becomes this pathway to empowerment yeah. that is life changing for anybody who gets to see it, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, as they write or they do improv or they create their plays, and I follow their lead, um, it, the healing that happens with, with art and, and as, uh, art as, as resistance, right, mm -hmm. to being told to shut up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Hiroshi, I wanted, to, this is something that in terms of being able to do your poetry, right, to express and talk about the experience, um, do you think it's taken some of what you've described before as people felt shame, right, about that experience and about even though it was not, it was forced upon them, there was still a shame associated with it. Has what you've done in the process of art helped release some of that in the community? Uh, yes, there was a feeling of shame uh, and guilt, uh, which kept uh, a lid on our, ourselves. And we didn't talk about our experience for many years. And it was the young people who became curious about what happened to their parents and grandparents during the war. And so we were encouraged to, to speak out gradually. It took me uh, some courage to, 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 to speak of what, what really happened. And it was in 1975, uh, about 30 years after the the uh, incarceration that I first spoke publicly mm. and to the young people, it was a revelation. And they it seemed to explain the, the habits and attitudes of their parents. And so uh, that's how, but then in a way it was a, an aid for me to 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 express myself and feel comfortable about my experience. Yes. Oh, is it, did you want to add something? Yeah. Well, I am really thinking about what art does to our social justice yes. um, struggles. I mean, I, I do feel that art brings another like um, different angles to see mm. an issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Totally. And also, it allows to to breathe, to refresh an idea. And sometimes when, we, I mean, like the stories that we, that we investigate, that we, we tackle are, are really, you know, horrible. I mean, they're like intense that yes. you need so much support, but, but, but you're looking at, at a different angle of that problem or like a, um, a symbol, a, a metaphor, a, a poem, or something that it will kind of allow to expand our like our, our view or or find a way to a, a solution of that problem. Yeah. And I yeah. think that's kind of the power of art that that we do, especially looking at the intersection between contemporary art and social justice. Yes, well, and it, Fabiana. Yeah, well, I mean, it, and it goes even deeper than that. I mean, the thing is, human beings retain knowledge more if it's through their emotions rather than their rational brain. So if you're creating a play that moves people, 
not only will you create something in their brain that helps them create empathy, but they are more likely to be moved to action if they're experiencing the story in an emotional way versus, you know, me telling you, this is good, this is bad. So, so you I mean in terms of expressing it politically? Right, that, that p politically, politically, po politically actually emotional. doesn't, it, it, it turns politically doesn't, politics doesn't move people. Emotions move people more. And so often when you're telling very compelling stories, people don't feel like they're being politicized. They feel like they're being moved and their ability to feel empathy is much higher. So, and this is, this, is, this is also key because if you think about it, they're putting themselves in someone else's shoes. It's that they're seeing the world through the lens that you're offering. And when you really understand that, then you can understand why it's such a problem that most of the time, the world that we're seeing, the lens we're using to see the world is the lens of white men. They've, they've made, they have, they've dominated it. So I think it really calls, it, it really makes it even more urgently that if we are to build a, a, you know, an equal and democratic space, we need to see the world from everyone's eyes, right? Which means we need more black filmmakers, more you know, filmmakers of color, theater, like we just, we, we're not even close to where we need to get. But you're basically saying at the level of emotion, it reminds me of this question. Yeah. It says, Kat Brooks and Fabiana, how do we engage with people and communities beyond our comfort zone through mm. art? to both speak our truth, but also reach new audiences. And I think a yeah, lot of what you're saying, totally. I mean, you've said before, Fabiana, that you think art can sometimes be the most powerful when it's issue agnostic. It's not right. that it's not addressing an issue, right. but what's up front is the connection, the, the emotion, the, the experience or the story that people can then connect through empathy. And I think that was partly yeah. the power of Tasha for you, Kat Brooks. I don't know if you have any other ideas about breaking through and, and reaching new audiences that you want to add? Well, I, mean, mm -hmm. I, I think doing the, the pieces in non-political spaces. So mm -hmm. um, doing the show at Eastside, right, there's a particular demographic of people that are going to come to Eastside Arts Alliance, right? Usually politically, we're in political alignment. Um, <clears throat> But when I took Tasha to the Fringe, right, which she won best of, by the way, um, <laughs> she was just recently yes. at the Fringe, and that's a whole nother demographic of people, right? Those are people that wanted to see a bunch of plays and in the theater, et cetera, but didn't necessarily have a, a lens or an analysis around police violence. Um, and then sat through that 35, 40 minutes, and I, I, I can't even tell you how many yeah. people came up to me afterwards and like, I didn't think about it this way and I have to go sit with this now and sent follow-up emails and you know what I mean? And so I think like trying to, but that's that whole thing to it being white male dominated. I'm a survivor of 10 years in Los Angeles as an actor. Um, <laughs> <sighs> um, but like pushing the envelope yeah. and, and, and figure out where are the spaces where we can sneak in, mm -hmm. right? And folks are exposed to something they weren't necessarily expecting to be exposed to and, and have those conversations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jose, you want to say Well, I, I think uh, for, for an artist, we need to look at the, the, we need to be working with the places that hold power. But at the same time, what we do need you mean to by be, places that hold? Power? Like you know, like if if uh, Yerba Buena Center for the Arts presents me, mm. or like you know the opera, or like yeah. you know like the Oakland Museum, that they are very well well established institutions. Like I go there and I present my work, but at the same time I work parallel with my community. With mm -hmm. with like I go deep with the community. I think that's something that I feel like a lot of artists, especially of color, are missing, working deeply in a community base. And I think that's the reason for me that is very important, like, you know, when we did the Anastasia project that it happened in East Oakland, mm -hmm. we interviewed the community. We were working like almost three years to be working and to be, you know, gathering the testimonies of the people, and that was our base of our story. Are do the institutions that hold power as you describe, are they interested in that? Are they interested in showcasing that deep look into community. I think they do, but we need to have more. Yeah, mm. yeah. I think this is the, the other part of this conversation that I want to get into, which is also kind of related to this question, is it 
it is always challenging for artists, particularly artists working for social justice, to find the economic resources yes, to support their work. Yes. Yeah. Yet artistic okay. creations like the recent film Black Panther have generated billions. Do you see this as an opportunity to bring much needed resources back into yeah. our community? And Fabio, yeah. you have really looked at the arts totally. sector. So talk totally. a little bit about how wealth well, resources okay, are. Okay, so to first, um, we live in, in severe arts inequality. Like if you look at all the money at the national level, the billions of dollars that go into the arts, only 4% go to communities of color. So 96% of the art money in this country goes to the operas, basically the SOBs. And how did you pull this stat? Like it's, it's, it's a stat that was in the Not Just Money report from Helicon Collaborative. Um, Helicon Collaborative does a lot of studies on the state of the arts. Not just that, but Four out of five working artists in this country are white. If you wanna, if you're a young kid of color, most likely you're in a district that doesn't have the arts, like LA Unified, and even, I mean, Oakland has a big problem with mm -hmm. the arts. Um, so imagine you're a kid of color, you wanna be creative, your school's not gonna, K through eight, not gonna, not gonna cut it. Then you wanna go to college, but the most expensive universities in this country that don't offer scholarships, seven out of 10 are art schools. So not gonna happen there. Then you're like, oh, I, I finally, I got some good work, I'm gonna go present it. Well, guess what? 96% of the curators are white. They're just not gonna hire you or they're not gonna write roles for you because there's no funding for your film because you know what? The white execs, they just don't like it. It's just, they just don't like it. They don't like, they don't see you in a role that they can support. So there's institutional inequality at every single level, and it's for film, for acting, for publishing, for the visual arts. So there's, we need to have a conversation on cultural inequality because we can't just say, oh, I love artists, I want more artists, but guess what? Social movements are not hiring artists. They're hiring organizers. There's actually no room for us, and so I think we are in a kind of a bit of a crisis because we know that the social justice sector needs us. They're not gonna win without us, but there are, if, if you are a young artist and you graduate, I don't know, from music school, you're like, you know what, I really care about climate change. There's no way for you to go work. Honestly, there's no, no one's going to commission you. Um, no one's going to hire you to help them on their campaigns. And this is a problem, and it's because the philanthropy sector has traditionally not invested in the space that we call arts and social justice. So not only do we have an inequality problem because we don't have resources to go into the arts, but then the, our very community, which should be embracing us, there's just no roles for us. And so I think that one of the solutions is first that that we all take an interest in cultural policy because I think it's in addition to all the other things like deportations and police brutality, unless we address cultural policy, which is a very invisible problem, we are going to continue to be in a space of, you know, just always being on the fringes. Um, but also we need, to, we, we need to ask ourselves, how do we begin to create an ecosystem where artists who do care about these issues are building institutions, they're building power, they're organizing, we're looking at the pipeline, we're looking at the next 10 to 20 years of artists, how are we preparing? Um, for them, and then finally, how are we disrupting the current institutions? I mean, we have a California Arts Council. Each of you has a city arts commission. Look at look at their funding. Just look at it. I mean, City of Oakland, we are so behind on this stuff. Are Luckily, feeling, we have a cultural plan. Are you Coming. feeling hopeful with the new cultural plan? I mean, you just mentioned the cultural plan. Yes, I'm feeling hopeful. Roberto Villa is awesome. I'm feeling hopeful about him, but I think that at the at the at the state and national level, we are we are facing such severe cultural inequality. I mean, if you four percent of all the money, California I think is a little better, but it's nothing you know impressive. Um, I, I I really find myself at kind of a a a moment because a lot of artists want to do this work, and honestly, I don't know what to. We just we don't have the the ecosystem to make room for them. So I think it just requires us to really put our heads together and, and find solutions. Jose, you want to... Oh, go ahead, Jose. No, just I wanted to say that um, it has been a, kind of a, a movement to really look at the budget of Oakland mm -hmm. and really yeah. looking at, and I think Cabros can help me in this, like, you know, looking at the kind of at the budget of the police department and trying oh, to yeah. really figure it out, you know, <laughs> how how is it that they have so much money and... And how can we get that money from that 
to other social services and, and our centers. And I'm just, I wanted to... I mean, just so people are really yeah, clear yeah. about how much money they have, and then I want to make the yeah. point I want to make, is that of the general fund, the Oakland Police Department gets half of the general fund. They get 50% oh. of the general fund. 50%. And that has been happening for years, and there was a major movement that, that just took place around this budget cycle, right, for people to say, to defund them by half and reinvest those resources. We were, we were standing in, in partnership with artists. We were standing in partnership with people, the mental health workers, social services, right, all of the things that we know actually keep people safe and are actually crime preventers instead of crime responders. So there's a debate around whether OPD responds to crime. Anyway, that's not this panel. Yeah. Um, but art and but, cultural support gets what? But art and cultural oh, yeah. support gets a, a fraction of that, fraction and I don't have the. A it's a million dollars. Million yes, dollars yeah. of grants. And they right. had to fight it's to and nail dollars. for that yeah. this budget cycle. And the other thing that happens because I, I, I see it with myself, I, I, I see it um, with um, who's in her name, the owner of Betty Ono, um, uh, Anika. Thank you, Anika, who was at every single flipping. Uh, uh, City, City Council. Council meeting. Uh, <laughs> yes, we love your movement. <laughs> uh, with me, I know I'm, it's, it's a joke, but you heard when Fred read my, my bio, I have like 5,000 jobs, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. yes. we, get, we get subsumed mm -hmm. into the movement in all of these different ways mm -hmm. that but actually I pay the bills. When really what we want to do is be making theater, making art, know, making just... poems, making dance, make, telling mm. stories. Yes. But that we can't, I have a child, I have to feed my daughter. Yeah. How many of you have just... contemplated leaving the Bay Area because it's so <laughs> hard, it's so expensive here and it's hard to be an artist here? I came from LA, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, mean, I mean, let me tell you, like if my, if my landlords, um, uh, evict me, I, I don't think I can afford it to live here because I've been control. I mean, like, yeah. yes, I have a, a, a loft, like, it's very nice, but if I lose that, I don't, I don't think I will be able to be here. <laughs> and that's reality. <laughs> and that's reality. Yeah. It says, could the Obama Foundation funding for artists of color? That's, that's question marks. I think we're talking about just how how institutions can do a better job of supporting artists. And that, yeah. I think, is the question. I mean, Oakland is starting to grapple with that question, but it's a bigger question, especially as we hear about the power of art, especially yeah. at this time. Yeah, and I think it's also a question Viana. of valuing the artists and their work, because, again, I feel like, and, and, and I, I think this is a conversation that philanthropy has to have, because we're also in a state where some of our major philanthropists have cut their arts programs, and there is actually no, there is only two national funds that actually explicitly support artists working in social justice, and that they're both in New York. Um, but I think that we, we need to just understand that if artists are to make an impact and if they're going to build institutions and if they're going to actually do their best work, I mean, you just need time to do your best work. <laughs> we have to invest in them and support them. And we really need to think about how do we compensate them in a way so that it's, it's you know, I mean, artists are not even making minimum wage often. Mm -hmm. And I think it just, it, I, I really encourage um, philanthropy, but also the social justice sector, those of you who, who run institutions, to really think about, you know, how do you push your boards to have artists in residence programs and support artists? I mean, artists, the, the other problem is artists can't start their nonprofits. So it's almost like we're these like free floating agents with really great ideas, but we don't have infrastructure in order to support. And so I think you know, one of the things that my organization is looking at is how do we support artists entrepreneurs so that you know you can build your theater company, your training school, you know, you can scale the amazing things that you're doing. Because I really think that our young people need need these services. So just like we invest in entrepreneurs with great big tech ideas, we can be doing the same for artists who really want to scale. And in, in the Bay Area, it's a big problem. You know, San Francisco has been decimated. The, the the number of artists that used to be here compared to now is, is very, is, is the, it's been a big drop. And Oakland, we're, we're next. You know, I think that it's, it's, it's a very kind of scary um, thing, I, I actually heard all the artists are, that, that LA now has some of the highest concentration of artists, but I think even like the quality of life in our cities is so different when we have a, um, a thriving artist culture that is work about and by the artists from the communities that are there. Mm -hmm. Hey, Roshi, do you think there's enough support of local artists 
You're you you're based in Sacramento, is that right? Or no, no. Or you okay? Well, <laughs> uh, what was the question? It just in terms of support for local artists. Do you think there's enough support out there? Uh, no, I don't think so. The artists are always asking for funds and, and struggling. Uh, if one is in a theater group, I mean, it, it's a wonder how they, they <laughs> carry on from day to day. Uh, I used to belong to the Asian American Theater Company, and they went through all kinds of financial turmoil, and it was a struggle. And I've studied art in my background, and I've always been amazed by the all the art that people created. And I, I often wonder, how were they able to do that? You know, there's immense buildings, cathedrals, and uh, all kinds of arts that we can't even imagine in our society. So, of course, there were groups like churches and patrons and wealthy that sponsored the artists. Yes. Yeah, which we don't have now. Do you think artists, Fabiana, maybe this is for you, artists need to be, do more to make their case? You know how you're talking about how um, yeah, <laughs> people who are involved in the movement are, are yeah. hiring organizers. Well, not no, artists. I think that... I think that if you look at the nonprofit industrial complex and you look at even from the fact, no, like the civil rights era, that the way you measured value is by measurable outcomes, meaning how many boots on the ground do you have, how many people are registering to vote, and what policy are you changing? So we are in a philanthropic space where people prioritize policy, which is so like flabbergasting to me because I'm like, we're losing. We lose so bad year after year and yet we continue to invest in 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 what, what I call the social justice organizing sector. And we say, oh, you know, you gotta register people to vote. You got to you know you have to write your op eds and convince Senator XYZ to vote for this. That's the the dominant lens and we are barely entering at the national level into a conversation that says, oh wait, what about culture? And they use it, the word that's used for it is narrative change, but it's really culture change. Culture, we have to change culture, and we changing culture is very different than changing policy. So I think what needs to happen, not that artists need to make their case better, I think that we need to have a holistic view of how to achieve social change. And it includes its three elements: economics, po politics, and culture. I mean, the economic sector definitely gets organized. You saw what you know, Walmart and Dick's could do in terms of, re, you know, their, e the economic sector has power. They can do and try things. You mean in Political terms of reducing access to, or not No, just changing, changing, like they can change behaviors by changing what they do. Political sector, we already know that that works. But in the cultural sector, I think that we need to really invest more and also just really think about, it's really the works of hearts and minds. How do you change hearts and minds? And that's the work that artists do. And so I think it's really about us reframing. I mean, in reality, the nonprofit industrial complex is not even that old. It's, it's still a system that's evolving. So I think that it really requires, you know, um, really philanthropy people who are funding, luckily grant makers in the arts is gonna be in Oakland this year. But I think we really need to think about, look, we can't just have an arts world over here and a social justice over here. Like what's the bridge and how do we really start resourcing our movements? Can well, I just, just yes. one concrete example of things yeah. that people that people in the nonprofit industrial complex could do is like when you're writing those grants, include the artist yes. arm. Thank you. Right? Like, include the artist's arm in whatever you're setting into the foundation. Because what a lot of y'all do, if you're in this room, is then call us when the big event happens at the end of the work and yes. ask us to come for free. Yes. Right? No, for real. That's exactly and, what happens. And we do because we care about social justice, right? Yes. So we show up. But, no, yeah. but, but really, like, yeah. we need to start thinking about these things on the front end instead mm -hmm. of the back end. Yes. And make that part of your funding and then get at an artist and be like, yo, I got 20 racks for you to, like, develop the cultural arm of this defund the Oakland yeah. Police Department movement. And I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you because you're an artist, you're artist and, and I'm an organizer. <laughs> so I trust you to make the art. I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to look over your shoulder. <laughs> well, I've, got, I've gotten a couple of <laughs> questions from audience members that are pretty issue specific. I'll just read them to give you a, a sense, but I don't necessarily need you to 
um, respond to each of these specifically. But it says, to the panel, how will you deal with the new census question? President Trump mm -hmm. wants resistance, marching, et cetera. We all need to do, uh, we all need to do, sorry, I'm unable to read this last sentence, but it's really <laughs> to do the census. You know, for Kat, when it comes to police terror, I always hear the cops saying they feel threatened, thinking someone has a gun. Why is there zero discussion about innocent until proven guilty as a foundation of justice? Um, and then I am a mass shooting survivor. What kind of projects are you all working on to help the cause? And this is from A. Hinman, and I'm very sorry to hear that. Um, and there's also, uh, you know, what are your thoughts, perceptions, et cetera, of anxiety, trauma, stress of black people living in the U.S. upon viewing videos of state violence against them? Mm. So I guess there are a lot of things that you could focus on. So my question in the last five minutes that we have is, where are you focused <laughs> right now? What's next for you? What's calling you? What's, what do you want to embody? <laughs> I'll start with you, Jose. Yeah. Well, just I want to bring some light to the, to the, to the local work that, that Eastside is doing. And um, you know, there is um, um, also, I wanted to mention like all these cultural centers that exist in, in Oakland that we should be uh, supporting mm -hmm. because of the legacy and all the work that they have done, like the Malonga Cascalor Center for the Arts. I mean, it's a great place for our community. The Oakland Asian Cultural Center is in, in deep in, in Chinatown. The Intertribal Friendship House that they have been there for many years. Uh, we need more art centers in deep, in, in deep uh, East Oakland. And definitely, like, you know, we need to just bring some intentions there. Um, Eastside uh, Arts Alliance is um, initiating this um, program or this initiative called the Black Cultural Zone mm -hmm. that we wanted to secure a formerly um, Safeway uh, headquarters, which is an international 57. And we wanted to secure it to, you know, to bring a black business zone that that's what we need, that's what we need to have, which we promote health, culture, and education. And um, you might, probably you, you will, you know, will get to know more about this, this program or this initiative that they cite. So you're busy. Is it? <laughs> you're busy. <laughs> yeah. Kat, what are you doing? Um, so my friend Ayodele Wurzlinger in Zynga says that she believes that God whispers into your ear before you're born, and she believes that God whispered into her ear, make art, and so I've sort of evolved that to say that God whispered in this ear, make art, on this ear, make revolution. <laughs> so I'm doing both. <laughs> um, so, so one is more performances of Tasha. I'm part of the Three Girls Theater Company playwriting cohort, and so I have, um, I'm, I'm doing some redevelopments. Um, I was just on a panel with Andrea Ritchie, who has spent the last two decades of her life focusing on the intersection of state violence and the women of body, women of color bodies. Um, and so we're actually talking about making a series um, of these pieces. Um, similarly, continue to tell Tasha's story everywhere and anywhere that people will let me um, tell it. I'm putting together a book of poetry that I've amassed from around the time of Oscar Grant to now. Um, and then I, I do want to get to that to that question because, um, and I'll do it quickly because I know we're almost out of time. But you know, a couple of weeks ago, the San Francisco Police Department fired 99 bullets into the trunk of a car where a 19-year-old child was, and you know, there's people going back and forth. Well, what if he had a gun? Da, 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 da. I've never said these words before in my life. Well, till recently. Um, what about compassionate policing? Right now, I'm an abolitionist. Like, I don't think this thing is ever gonna work. But, but I, I don't understand how you have this this guy who you know for a f just went in and shot up 17 people, including children. So you know for a fact that he had a gun, right? And you somehow managed to take him into custody alive. Or we could talk about Dylan Roof, who you took to Burger King after he massacred nine black people in their place of worship. So I know for a fact that it is possible for you to know that somebody has a firearm and figure out some compassionate way to bring that person to custody and take them yeah, into. You can't tell me that you can't do that with black and brown bodies, right? You can't tell me you can't do it with black and brown bodies. That is a choice you are making because you look at our bodies like we are enemy combatants. And that's whether you're a black cop, a white cop, a Latinx cop, right? Once you put on the uniform, you're blue and you're following with the training. And, and so, so they're, not, they're not scared, they're at war. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
Um, I am Fabian. looking at uh, cultural inequality at the national level. I'm uh, investigating what is it going to take, what types of collaborations between philanthropy and the social justice sector and artists is it going to take to change cultural inequality. Right now I'm focused mostly on the arts and entertainment, so I'm helping organize artists, um, visual artists, but also artists in Hollywood, actors, directors who are really looking at addressing equity starting in Hollywood and thinking about how we can take those models and replicate them in mm. all the art sector. And also really trying to work with the um, social justice sector to see how what, what do we need to do differently? How do we better integrate artists of color, artists from marginalized communities in order to build a very robust and um, vibrant social justice space. And then finally, I'm working on an artist as activist training curriculum because there's so many of us and we need real tools. Like we really need to learn. We're, if, we're, if we're not going to get hired in the social justice sector, how do we form our own, build our power and get trained to be activists? Hiroshi, what are you working on right now? Um, well, I feel that... Uh, that I should speak out about my experience, though I'm finding it more and more difficult. And uh, our son, who is an activist, says, well, just show up. Mm, that's great. <laughs> that's right. That's great. You're, that's you're, right. Uh, just show up. <laughs> He says, you're a survivor of the, the incarceration, the injustice. And so I feel that I'm responsible for speaking out uh, of um, my past. And, uh, and though, <laughs> as I say, I have problems, uh, loss of hearing, and when I try to speak, uh, uh, off copy. <laughs> I, I, when I come to a key word, I can't, I can't remember it, and so, <laughs> so I have to replace the word. <laughs> well, <This is> not... <laughs> we are we are so glad you showed up today, and all of these artists who show up today and every day, uh, Hiroshi. Kashiwagi, 95-year-old Nisei actor and author of Starting from Loomis and Other Stories. <laughs> Fabiana Rodriguez, interdisciplinary artist, political activist, and executive director of Culture Strike, a national arts organization advocating for migrants' rights. Kat Brooks, performer, activist, and co-founder of the Anti-Police Terror Project. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and Jose Navarrete, a dancer, an activist, producer of uh, Live Arts in Residence and the Eastside Arts Alliance in that's Oakland. Right. So this program has been sponsored by the San Francisco Foundation and is part of the Foundation series focused on people, place, and power in the Bay Area. We thank our audiences here and on radio, television, and the internet. We want to remind everyone that there will be a reception immediately following the program outside this room, and you will also see some of the art uh, that our panelists have done on display and for sale. My name is Mina Kim, and... This meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you're in the know, is adjourned. <laughs> oh.